Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship. I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning, that we can gather virtually is a blessing, even if we can't be together in person. But I do invite you to come in person at four o'clock this afternoon for our parking lot parade. Um, our main purpose will be to collect the swim baskets for those of you who have promised a basket of food for our neighbors, and also for each of us to either pick up a candle or to bring with you, downloaded onto your phone, the candle app, and participate in our socially distanced passing of the light, um, which will be about 4.20 or so um, as we get gathered all the way around our parking lot, masked and socially distanced in our little family bubbles. Um, we will pass the light of Christmas to one another and we will be filming that for our worship on the 24th. Finally, I wanna make sure that you know to come to worship next week because our children and our youth will be helping us to lead worship and you will not want to miss that. But for now, I invite you to find your comfy chair and refill your coffee cup and take a deep breath and arrive in our worship space to enter the presence of the living God. We gather in this holy space to bear witness to the light. The love of God shines upon us and reveals the truth of God's mercy. We gather in this holy space to bear witness to the truth. The truth of our gospel is good news for the oppressed and a balm for the brokenhearted.
Watch and wait for for way of Christ's coming, like candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, remembering the promises of God with prayer. We light this candle in hope. Wait, nope. We light this. We light this candle for peace. Light this candle. Light the candle and go. Like a third candle lit in the darkness, joy shines brighter and brighter and dances in the wind. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. In a world that sometimes feels the void of joy, in a year that we have missed out on unexpected, routine joys, God, help us find the joy in the unexpected, in the desperation, in the silver linings. The, the Lord, Lord has done, done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Um, where am I? God, we trust that you are with us, and that those who soar in tears will weep with shouts of joy. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoice. Let our mouths be filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. Let us proclaim the truth to the ends of the earth. We have joy because God is with us. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced.
A voice is crying out in the wilderness, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Mighty and powerful God, your word says rejoice always, but we would rather sulk about the things that don't go right. Your word says pray without ceasing, but we go for days without even thinking about you. Your word says give thanks in all circumstances, but our thankfulness is fleeting because we think we deserve blessings. Your word says hold fast to what is good while we hold fast to sinful ways of thinking and acting. The prophets of old have declared, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The first reading of the word comes from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. The Spirit of God, the Master, is on me because God anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, announce freedom to all captives, pardon all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of his grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, and to comfort all who mourn to care for the needs of all who mourn in Zion, give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid spirit, rename them oaks of righteousness planted by God to display his glory. They'll rebuild the old ruins, raise a new city out of the wreckage. They'll start over on the ruined cities, take the rubble left behind and make it new. You'll hire outsiders to herd your flocks and foreigners to work your fields. But you'll have the title priests of God, honored as ministers of our God. You'll feast on the bounty of nations. You'll bask in their glory. Because you get a double dose of trouble and more than your share of contempt, your inheritance in the land will be doubled and your joy will go on forever. Because I, God, love fair dealing and hate thievery and crime, I'll pay your wages on time and in full and establish my eternal covenant with you. Your descendants will become well known all over. Your children in foreign countries will be recognized at once as the people I have blessed. I will sing for joy in God, explode in praise from deep in my soul. He dressed me up in a suit of salvation. He outfitted me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom who puts on a tuxedo and a bride a jeweled tiara. For as the earth bursts with spring wildflowers, and as a garden cascades with blossoms, so the Master, God, brings righteousness into full bloom and puts praise on display before the nations. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from the book of John in the first chapter. Hear the word of God for the people of God. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed, he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. They said to him then, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, they asked him, Then why are you baptizing, if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know, even he who comes after me, 
the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. This took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of God for us today. On this, the third Sunday of Advent, we pause in the somber stillness of the season to anticipate the joy that we will meet at the manger on Christmas Day. Joy that bursts forth even from the darkest hour when new creation still lies beneath the surface. I will sing for joy in God, explode in praise from deep in my soul, cries Isaiah. For as the earth bursts with spring flowers, and as a garden cascades with blossoms, so the master, God, brings righteousness into full bloom and puts praise on display before the nations. Such joy accompanies Jesus' embodiment in our world. Joy that runs so much deeper than the transient experience of fleeting happiness. Joy that wells up from within our souls from the secret places where pain and grief take root alongside the abiding presence of God, whose spirit accompanies us in every time and place of our lives. This is the joy of God's never-ending love in the face of the brokenness of our world. It is the joy of the resurrection following the betrayal and torture and death of the cross. Such emotion does not depend on all being right in the world. Indeed, it relies solely on the steadfastness of a God who will not let us go. It is this joy that we mark and remember this morning, a joy more precious than it may have been in years gone by, as we cling to it in the face of the mounting loss, soul-shattering grief, and bone-deep weariness of our pandemic time. It is the gift and challenge of our faith that God holds this joy out to us no matter where we stand on life's pathway. Just as the Israelites hear Isaiah's message on the cusp of their return to Jerusalem and the Holy Land, but before they've been able to rebuild the temple, we too can hear this shout of joy as we stand at the crossroads of despair and hope, waiting for the vaccine that may bring healing to our nation but still exiled from what much of what matters most to us and what defines us as the people we believe ourselves to be. Now is a time to cling to this joy, to seek it out and invite it to take up residence in our hearts in defiance of the despair of our times. In stubborn affirmation that Christmas always comes, our God always reaches out to us, our joy can still thrive only and completely, because God is with us, no matter what. This week, I had the joy of remembering Christmas's past with our deacons, as we lived into a new way of being in community together in this strange and different Advent season. As we journeyed around our Zoom room, taking turns speaking through a process of mutual invitation, each one invited the next one to share. Soon we could see a new tapestry being woven together in our midst, a beautiful creation made out of our individual voices as memories were lifted up, laughter and tears and love revisited. As the stories unfolded, I could feel the connections between us strengthen. I could see the lifting of our spirits in brightened eyes. I could hear the remembered joy echoed in shared laughter and cries of, oh, I remember that. We even talked in that moment about times when remembered grief now brings joy of shared community that held us close even as we mourned. This joy we seek at Christmas has not disappeared. It waits just beneath the surface for us to notice it and invite it in. Our church foremothers and forefathers those who first imagined this Advent time as a way to prepare to come close to the mystery of Christmas. They knew that we would, they, we would need to pause along the way to revive our spirits, because waiting is hard work, even when we know we are waiting for a God who will come no matter what, even when we know we are waiting for a God who will not let us go, even when we know that the darkness we may feel 
cannot overcome the light that has already been sparked. Even then, we still need help waiting, because waiting is worth it. Waiting brings us Jesus, our beloved God with us, who proclaims in Isaiah's voice the beginning of his own ministry among us. The Spirit of God, the Master, is on me because God anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, heal the heartbroken, announce freedom to all captives, pardon all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of his grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, and to comfort all who mourn. How can we not be joyful when we hear good news announced in the voice of our God made manifest among us? At the same time, perhaps we're also asking, what exactly does this good news that Jesus preaches mean to us today? John the Baptist has some inkling about it. When the religious leaders come to challenge him about his practice of baptizing people, he points to Jesus, the one who will come after him, the light to which he testifies, the one they do not know. John knows that Jesus will baptize us with something far more than water of repentance that John offers. John comes only to prepare the way in the wilderness. Jesus himself brings the restoration that Isaiah promises God's people. Jesus will free us from captivity and heal our broken hearts. All of this leads me to wonder, what holds us captive today? What does Jesus promise to free us from? Of course, there are many among us who are literally held captive. Children of God, like the one in three black men in our country who will spend some time in jail or prison over the course of their lives. Children of God, like the young girls sold as child brides into a life of abuse and slavery. Children of God, like the political dissidents who oppose the governments that oppress them. There are those of us who are held captive in other ways, too. Children of God who are at the mercy of an abusive domestic partner. Children of God who live with broken relationships that are life-denying. Children of God whose memories have been lost and who now travel life no longer aware of who and whose they are. Children of God who live with addiction, mental illness, physical disabilities, or economic distress. Children of God who live with hunger, homelessness, and unemployment. There are those of us who have been enslaved to various aspects of a culture that values not the kingdom values that Jesus proclaims, but other things. Things like power, wealth, fame, and prestige. Things like hoarding of money and resources, piling up of privileges and influence, and promoting of profit over people and greed over compassion. One of the biggest lies we tell ourselves is that we are in control of our lives, that we can create the circumstances to ensure our safety and our thriving, that we can control what we need to bring ourselves happiness and satisfaction, that we can protect ourselves from loss and grief, anger and fear. The truth is, we cannot do any of these things, not really. But even in the face of such uncertainty, God promises salvation and restoration, joy and peace and hope. What is that about? How can God promise that? I believe the answer lies in the joy we have been discussing. A joy that depends not on material things or outside circumstances, but solely on the presence of the Holy One who enters into our lives at the deepest levels, reaching out to heal the places that hurt the most, the corners of despair and hopelessness that we carry in our own broken hearts. The good news that Jesus proclaims, and which Isaiah previously promised, is that we are never alone as we travel through life. God accompanies us every step of the way. We may think we are journeying alone, but like that famous prayer about the footprints in the sand, God does not abandon us in our hour of need. God carries us. Christ carries us. Jesus carries us. 
Where do we see this divine one carrying us? Why, quite often, we see it in the actions and words of our own community. Every time we reach out to offer comfort or compassion, reassurance or a listening ear, we carry out Jesus' promise to heal the heartbroken. Every time we construct a sandwich and take it to St. Joe's, or fill a box with swim food, or contribute a package to the Cameron Outreach Project, we help preach the good news of God's abundance for the poor. Every time we encourage a friend to get help with something that is controlling their lives, we announce a way of freedom to the captives. Every time we offer forgiveness to a loved one who has wronged us and now seeks reconciliation, we participate in God's pardon for all prisoners. Every time we advocate for people who suffer with homelessness and poverty, we announce the year of God's grace. Every time we receive the tears of the brokenhearted, we carry out a piece of God's promised comfort for all who mourn. Isaiah calls the faithful to rebuild the old ruins, start over on the ruined cities, take the rubble left behind, and make something new. What are cities called to build up? What ruins are we charged to rebuild? In this moment, there is no shortage of destruction in our world. So many of our cities are devastated by poverty and addiction, racial violence, and lack of opportunities to thrive. So much of our natural world is devastated by overuse and, po and pollution, greed for resources, and lack of concern for any living creature but ourselves. So many of our communities are devastated by toxic and violent behavior, lack of respect, and a willingness to lie, broken trust, and selfish greed. How are we called to take this joy that God promises, this deep sense of God's promised presence in every time and place, and head out into the world to proclaim the good news and rebuild these ruins? I think we start by attending to our own communities. We advocate for housing justice and equal access to education, health care, healthy food, and a living wage. We practice and promote restorative justice practices over retributive punishment. We do our part to manage our waste, to clean up our neighborhoods, to honor our natural world by using renewable resources, reducing our environmental footprints, and laying down our materialistic and consumerist ways. We speak to one another with respect and care. We display curiosity about differences and keep our minds open to new perspectives and ideas. We invite others to share their views, and we consider whether perhaps our own might need to change. We stop labeling people who don't agree with us as other or enemy, but instead as someone we need to understand better and learn to be in community with. This is the good news that Jesus proclaims and John has pointed to. It is the vision that Isaiah paints and we try to live out. Even in the darkest periods of our lives, we are called as people of faith to remain steadfast in following Jesus out into the world to live out the joy of God's presence with us, to invite others into that joy and to join in solidarity with all in our community who long for freedom and healing, pardon and comfort, good news, and a year of God's grace. It is one of our deepest blessings that Christmas comes no matter what. Even in our darkest hour, our deepest despair, our most hopeless moments, we can count on the faithfulness of the child who meets us in the stable, ready to carry our woes, to lift up our hearts, to sound the trumpet of hope deep into our lives. And that knowledge and certainty and faith can offer us joy, even as it sends us out into the world to proclaim the good news to our sisters and brothers. Jesus has come to set us free, to release us from the world's values, inviting us instead to lean into God's embrace, confident that restoration has already been offered to us. Let us go out in joy, continuing down this Advent road, 
rejoicing in the one who is coming. Please join me now in our affirmation of faith, especially prepared for our Advent time. Our souls magnify the Lord, and our spirits rejoice in God our Savior, for he looks with favor upon us and sees our unrealized potential. In the tradition of Mary and all who have said yes to God, we stand here today to add our assent to theirs. Like Mary, we feel overwhelmed. We wonder if we are worthy or capable of following the calling. Like Mary, we have our questions and we will not be afraid to ask them. Like Mary, we will hear and ponder the assurance that God will empower us. Like Mary, we will strive to say, let it be with us according to your will. To whatever God is inviting us, at this time in our lives, and relying on God's grace, we say yes. I invite you to join me now in the prayers of our community. At the end of each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Let us pray together. Holy One, we thank you for the joy of your steadfast presence in our lives, a presence that sets us free from all that holds us captive. We praise you for the beauty of your creation and the new life that even now prepares to burst forth in our midst. Guide us in how to seek your freedom and nurture that new life. Grant us patience as we wait for it to emerge. Give us wisdom about how to do your work in the world and teach us compassion for all those we encounter along the way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we approach the joy of Christmas, we ask you to surround those who feel instead only sorrow or pain, anger or fear. Enfold them in your all-encompassing love and comfort, and give us ears to hear and eyes to see where our neighbors are hurting, 
that we too may be instruments of your compassion and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As always, we pray without ceasing for all those suffering in this pandemic, the sick and those who care for them, those who have lost loved ones, those who have lost jobs, those who grieve and feel fear, those who are isolated and alone, those who are hopeless and weary, those who are living on the edge financially with no resources left, those who are hungry or homeless or cold. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In our own community, we lift up Joanne Vander, Andrea Unson's mother, Maria Hinchy, Gretchen Green, Babe Meyer, Bill DeSero's aunt, Phyllis. And we continue our prayers for Eric Paquin, Pearl and Dawn Plummer, Peter and Irene Derry, Angelica Alvarez and her brother Eric, and Marilyn Kaiser. Our deepest sympathy and prayers of comfort we raise for Durrett and Fitzroy Crossdale on the death of Durrett's niece, Samaya. For Paulette Morgan and her family on the death of her mother, Eloine Jensen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up now all the silent prayers of our hearts, Lord, the ones that you have heard already and for which you are preparing an answer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we join together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Prepare the way of the Lord. <laughs> 